Hi everyone, I'm Marluce Peters and in this short video I'm going to give an overview of fluidized bed bioreactors and how this is an emerging technology that has found important applications in biotechnology. So this is part of the, the course uh, different types of bioreactors. If you want to know more about other bioreactors, do check out the rest of the course. So I will give you an idea of what the advantages and what are the challenges are of working with this, and I'll give you some practical applications and design requirements. Now, first of all, I need to explain the principle of a fluidized bed bioreactor. So people might be more familiar with a uh, packed bath. A reactor where a reactor is filled with a granular solid material which in most cases is the catalyst uh, and this is packed on what we call the distributor. So since we are talking about bioreactors it does imply that the catalyst is something that is alive so it could be like an enzyme it could be cells for instance. So if we're talking about a packed bat the fluid that comes in which can be either a liquid or a gas is at low velocity. So basically it means that the particles will stay in place, so they are packed in that bed. However, when you start to increase the velocity, you start to achieve at a certain rate, is what we call incipient fluidization. So essentially, then you get to the stage where the force of the fluid is sufficient to support the weight of the material, so it's suspended, and basically the solid starts to behave as a liquid. Um, so when that happens, and when you go over that velocity, swirling starts to occur, and you get suspension of the particles and the fluidization happens. Now this is important because of this it has very uh, distinct advantages and very distinct applications in biotechnology which I will discuss in the next slide. Now, First of all the main advantages that you can think of obviously because your solid kind of starts to behave as a, as a liquid that will lead to a very uniform pattern in terms of both the mixing, so it's very good in terms of the mixing, but also in terms of the temperature profile. So you don't really have as much as a temperature gradient as you would get in other reactors. So this principle, as you can see, because the fluid has to go in and out, is therefore also inherently suitable for continuous operation. So in essence, it comes with all the traditional advantages, but also some of the advantages of continuous operation. And the biggest one here, obviously, continuous ap uh, operation at a particular scale tends to be more cost effective. So that's important to bear that in mind. However, uh, in, in terms of the disadvantage or the challenges of working with this technology, you have a higher initial costs, both for, for the capital of the reactor, but you have to remember that you have to, to pump in the liquid at quite like um, liquid or the gas, sorry, the fluid. Uh, at quite a high rate. So that means that it comes with very significant energy requirements, which is a big problem at the moment. Then similarly to a packed band, you would also have some kind of uh, pressure drop occurring. Uh, so typically you can use an ergon equation, uh, which you can see here, uh, to um, determine uh, the pressure drop. Uh, and there's uh, like an adapted form which you can use for a fluidized bed as well. And then the key thing is that the particles um, once they go like into the liquid or the gas, uh, what happens is that the removal afterwards can be quite complicated. And then further of all, you also have to imagine how you would do the packing of the catalyst, which is another disadvantage. And if you want to find more out about some of these advantages and challenges, then have a look at the link below to the paper. So then looking at the applications in bioreactors, a lot of the advantages and disadvantages relate back to the fact that you're working on the, uh, continuous operation, which, as I explained in a previous video, that this, um, with particularly the pharmaceutical industry, is moving more and more towards continuous operation because it's inherently more cost effective. So therefore, this type of the FBR is mainly applied to stable systems. And by stable system, I mean... Uh, if you are working with, with, for instance, microorganisms or anything biologically active that is genetically stable. So it has a low chance of uh, mutations and uh, developing over time. Um, because the challenges are that if you work with something which is genetically unstable, and the key example here of the viruses, as we've seen with COVID-19, because you're working on the uh, continuous operation mode, you have a higher chance of mutations and they can be non-producers, so you don't end up producing the product that you want. And, and therefore, the main applications have been in wastewater treatment, where you're dealing with a very uh, large um, stream, so very high uh, throughput that we have. And here, these FBRs have inherently larger surface area, which has some very distinct advantages, and anaerobic fermentations. So if you're looking at aerobic systems, 
it is more tends to be more suitable for the ones where you're working on the low shear conditions and where the oxygen requirements are relatively low. So for thinking about mammalian cell lines that typically can't withstand high shear and have a lower uh, oxygen requirements because they proliferate at a slower rate, that tends to be more suitable. But some of the disadvantages that you can get in these reactors is that you can have contamination occurring due to continuous operation. I mentioned genetic instability before. And also there can be issues around oxygen transfer. So that means therefore it's relatively less suitable for systems where the oxygen requirements are high. So a key example of where FBRs are very routinely used is in weightwater treatment uh, systems. Um, so they have a very high degree of mixing, as I mentioned before, and this large surface area also means uh, that it's very good in general for removal of contaminants because it does really support microbial growth. Um, so on the right diagram, you can see some typical applications in which FBRs are used. So we can look at oxidation processes, biological processes, again, because of large surface area that really supports the action of the microorganisms and absorption. So there's a wide range of applications. And actually in the 1980s, that um, in, in wastewater treatment conferences, which you can see in the link below, they hailed these FBRs as one of the most promising uh, technologies from the last 50 years. So that really gives you an indication of how important this is. If you wanted to see like a, a typical design and one of the links to the papers below, uh, this is where I took the, the diagram of the reactor from the left. You can see roughly what this looks like and uh, you know how it would look in practice if you wanted to remove contaminants, in this case dye molecules from wastewater using something like as hydrogen peroxide or some other type of catalysts. The most important here is probably the design requirements that you want to have a look at. Uh, so that's split up into different categories. So you inherently have lots of different types of FBRs. Uh, and really, as you can already see here in the diagram, uh, depending on the reactor and how it's designed to flow can be completely different. So there you see an example of where you have a flatbed versus a tapered bed FBR and you can see the direction of the flow and how mixing occurs is completely different. So the reactor geometry is very important. Uh, so this affects the, the mixing, as you can see in this diagram. It also affects the particle distribution. Now, there are other things to consider, such as, for instance, the aspect ratio. So that's the ratio of the static bed height, so the distributor height versus the reactor height. Uh, and then that has an impact on the fluid circulation velocity and, again, on mixing. You might have a reactor into which you have some internal structures, such as baffles, which can again influence mi mixing. And then the particle properties that you pack within the column have a very, very important function. So think of, for instance, the size of these particles, the loading uh, and the density of them. So these are all important factors to consider. Then externally, you obviously have a fluid, so a gas or a liquid coming in. So the superficial uh, um, fluid velocity is very important. And I've showed how you can calculate that in a previous video. And then obviously there's operational characteristics to consider. So for instance, the pH, the temperature, the chemicals and the biological material that you're working with. So this is a very brief summary of why fluidized bed bioreactors are a promising emerging technology. So they're not quite as well understood as for instance, a simple stir tank uh, bioreactor, but because of their very distinct advantages, which include that it's compatible with continuous operation, high degree of mixing and uniform temperature profile, they're rapidly finding more applications in biotechnology. And at the moment, most of these applications are uh, in wastewater treatment and anaerobic uh, fermentation. So I've discussed some of the crucial design parameters, which can be distinguished as, as kind of what's uh, outside of the reactor. So that's the, the fluid velocity coming in. And then what's inside the reactor, we have the particle properties, such as the density and the size and the packing. And then there's also the reactor to consider itself in terms of geometry and the aspect ratio. Um, and besides that, we obviously have the traditional uh, operating characteristics, such as pH and temperature, to consider. In a follow-up video, I'm going to go into more detail about uh, both packed bed bioreactors and FBRs and their application in biotechnology. But do have a look at our course, different types of bioreactors, if you want to know more about this topic in general. Thanks for watching.